All right, everybody, hello and welcome. As always, I'm Sean. This is episode one of our FC St. Pauli series and episode one in Football Manager 2021. I know what you're thinking. Where the fuck have you been? I've taken a couple of weeks off from the Football Manager content creation side to do some fantastic things with the reserveteam.com.au. You can check out the links to that channel in the description below. And also, I thought it was a really good time for us to try and upgrade some of our setup a little bit. So as you can see, I'm now at a standing desk, which I think is going to help kind of like our movement for the content and everything. Like I can really get a funk going if I need to. Uh, it does make the camera lose focus, but we'll work on that over the next couple of weeks. We've got an upgraded lights, which is helping out with the green screen quite a bit. We've of course got new backgrounds, new settings, all that sort of fantastic stuff just to try and you know progress the channel that little bit further. We've got some great stuff coming up in the next few weeks as well relating to like a logo redesign. The name will stay the same, but some very exciting things going on and I thought it would be best to try and get them all together at the same time. New microphone as well. Hopefully it's coming through loud and clear on your end. But worst case scenario, if it's not, just let us know in the comment section below. So much of what you're going to see on this channel and on this series is going to be driven by what you guys want to see. I cannot wait to get stuck into Football Manager 2021. I haven't played much of it, to be honest. I've gone into Melbourne City and done the first day just to kind of get used to the graphics and the interface and all that sort of stuff and to check out some players for some of our reserve team content. And then I've also started day one of a network save with a couple of friends as well, but we haven't actually clicked past that very first day. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I need to learn in the game if I want to win there and if I want to win here as well. And really, I can't wait to get stuck in and just kind of explore it a little bit further with you guys throughout the course of this series. So we're not going to waste too much time. We're going to jump in and we're going to get started with St. Pauli. So as you guys can see up here on the screen, brand new, haven't got any saves going. This is going to be the first one that we go through together. We're going to hit start new game. We're going to hit career and we're going to set up some of our divisions. You can see it defaults to Melbourne City, my home team town and the team I'm a member of. But we are going to drop in to Germany and Bundesliga 2 and set ourselves up with St. Pauli. We are going to do a couple of extra divisions and stuff as well. Magic of editing, I'll show you those now. So this is what we're going with. We're going with, of course, the Bundesliga 2 and above. I've gone with, and I'll show you from this table because it might be a bit easier to look at, all of the neighboring nations suggested, the likes of Austria, Czech Republic, uh, Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland. Uh, they've also suggested Poland and Holland. I'm going to tick those two in there as well. Uh, then we've got the big five. So Spain, Italy, Germany, France, and England all in there as well. I've also thrown in Argentina and Brazil. We'll talk about that a little bit further when we talk about our recruitment. But I think we're in good shape and a good position. We are just going to put Holland to just be the top division as we've done for pretty much all of the divisions. Same for Poland as well. And it says two and a half. I think that's fine. Large database. Behind my head, what you can't see is I've got do not use real fixtures ticked and do not add key staff. We'll get our own staff in throughout the course of the saving series. I've also ticked disable player attribute masking and prevent use of the in-game editor. The reason why I do the disable player attribute masking is it I will, I've always felt that trait, it's just kind of a delay. By the time you actually scout a player and scout them until full knowledge, you find out anyway. So I always felt it was kind of just you're keeping a bit of mystery and just effectively like elongating the game a little bit by like an extra click or two, particularly when you're playing through like long-term seasons and stuff. And if this save goes for like five or six seasons, the reality is we're going to scout everyone until we fully know them anyway. So it doesn't really do too much to kind of prevent that initial indication whether you like a player or not. So I don't check it, but if you're a person that checks it, that's absolutely fine as well. And of course, prevent use of the in-game editor. We always turn that one on. Not that I've even downloaded the in-game editor. We're going to go early in the preseason, and we're pretty much just going to hit start game. I've been hearing people rave about how quickly the game loads up, different game starts and that sort of stuff. This is the most leagues I think I've tried at any one particular time. I've also heard great things about how quickly it saves as well. So that'll be fantastic, particularly from a content creation perspective. All right, so it does load up pretty quickly. Got to give it credit where it's due. This is the guy that we're going to go with, Sean in the mixer, who I've used a couple of different test things. You can see this horrific burn-looking victim over here. We will replace that uh, as soon as we can in the game itself. Now, as far as my coaching badges are going, I'm going to go with Continental Pro. I feel like if I ever got a professional job in football, I would get you know the full experience. I'm going to go Sunday League Footballer, though. That is currently where I'm playing. My semi-professional days were very brief and a long, long time ago and a lot less kilos ago. So... The other portions I'm going to put together are I'm going to go with fitness and goalkeeper coaching because I think they're the two most difficult, like high quality coaches to find. So I can jump in and kind of fill those gaps for the team. The rest of the stuff like attacking, defending, tactical, I've got a strategy as to how I'm going to try and find some fantastic coaches to bring in for that. I'm also going to set up working with youngsters. You know me. If you've watched the channel for a couple of years, I can't help myself but go after Wonder Kids. So I want to get that going. I've also gone man management and motivating up to 16. Discipline, whatever, that's fine. No dramas. Player knowledge, youngster knowledge, my staff can take care of that. Adaptability, determination, I will, I will take care of that just by way of being myself and recording all this content all the way throughout the course of the year. 
Now, it does bring us to this screen. FC St. Pauli higher in the mixer as their manager, 31 years of age, 5.75K a week. As far as the Euros are concerned, on my contract, which is absolutely fantastic. You can see that fantastic kit in the background, the same one that we're wearing here, which is great for continuation of the series. FC St. Paul is three-star reputation as far as the global football scene is concerned, which isn't bad. I think that's probably the highest that we've started with in any of our series on the channel. Media prediction, seventh, absolutely fantastic. They've got a director of football and an assistant manager set up. I will probably turf those guys, to be completely honest. The Milan Tour Stadium, I always have to say it that way because it's hyphenated for some reason, 29,546 capacity, built in 1963. It's a fantastic stadium. It was the clue to uh, the giveaway that we did for Football Manager 2021, that mural of the pirate on the side of the home stand. Good training facilities, good youth facilities, fairly basic youth recruitment, all that stuff is fine. Last season finished 14th in the Bundesliga 2 and we enter the DFB Pokal at the first round. That will likely be, I think, the first fixture that we play potentially in this episode, but we'll see. Found in 1910, FC St. Pauli, a professional German club playing in the Bundesliga 2. FC St. Pauli narrowly avoided relegation from the Bundesliga 2 last season. That is very interesting. Uh, key uh, players or key people that we have to keep an eye on, our fierce rivals are FC Hansa Rostock and Hamburger FC. I think Rostock are the division below and Hamburger are in our division, so that'll be a huge one for us. No competitions won since 2007. A very proud history, though. We won the second tier in 1977 and were runners up three times, so they have gone up into the Bundesliga before. We're going to try and push them through to that level as quickly as we can. And a couple other lower division titles at the same time. They have suggested a 4-2-3-1 as being the key shape that we need to look at this season. They've got some decent players in there as well, which I'm kind of excited to have a look at and get to know further. We're not going to go with 4-2-3-1, though. We are going to mix it up. I try and do a different shape every series. I think I've got something in mind that I want to give a whirl on the channel this year. Expectations for the season. Sign players under the age of 23 for the first team. Absolutely perfect. That's kind of what I want to be doing anyway. We'll talk about transfer targets in a little bit. Work within a wage budget is required. Sign players to sell for a profit. Minimum two-year contracts for first-team players. Bundesliga finish in the top half. Perfect. DFB Pokal reach second round minimum. And then the future, uh, I've got another year on my deal which is fantastic. And they just want us to continue finishing in the top half, which is perfect. It's going to give us time to try and, I think, bring in some younger players. We'll talk about them further in a minute. And then also, you know, kind of build the team for the future so we go up into the Bundesliga in a really good position. All of this stuff for inductions, I'm going to get all of this sent today, even though some of it I have done previously. I haven't, like, even looked at training and stuff like that. I haven't looked at really the scouting windows and networks or anything like that. So we're going to get all that sent through and we'll click through that in a moment. Press comments to meet the media, absolutely fine. Interest squad friendly, I don't want right now. And send in a vast put report from the backroom staff. Yes, absolutely perfect. And we are going to get stuck straight in. Good news, it does save incredibly quickly, which is fantastic to see. Uh, you can see here FC St. Pauli High in the mixer's manager. Fantastic, pretty much the same stuff that we just went through. Players in their last year of contact, I'm just going to apply a recommendation to all. We'll deal with that in the next six months or so. Tactics induction. Now, this is an interesting part. I think tactically, I've got a couple of ideas, stuff that we're going to test out, but we're pretty much starting with a blank slate at the moment at the start of the game. We're going to put some stuff in. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to tweak it throughout the course of this season. Magic editing. I'm going to show you guys the tactic now. Right, so this is the tactic that I want to go with. Now, it is a 4-3-3. We haven't really done that shape on the channel. I want to kind of do something a little bit different, which is try and get a version of a formation and a shape that's one shape in defense and a different shape in attack. What I mean by that is, what I really want to get to is I would like to get effectively a 4-3-3 when we're out of shape, or maybe even a 4-5-1. If things don't work out, we might drop these wingers back a little bit further, play like a 4-1-4-1, which I know certain people have had success with throughout the course of the season. But then once we win the ball back, I kind of want us to transition to like a 4-3 or even a 3-2 or 3-4-3 kind of. So it would be effectively... This deep line midfielder just plays just in front of the defensive two, but almost as though they're a back three. The wing backs kind of push on a little bit further. The inverted wingers start to make their roads inside and it becomes kind of a 3-4-3 in possession. That's what I'm going for, right? That's the movement that I'm trying to set up and that's the pattern. But as I just put everyone back into their positions, the way that we're going to do that is with the sweeper keeper, two ball playing defenders to kind of stay back and stay defensive and kind of play the ball side to side when we need them to. Wing backs on attack, which worked really well for us in last year's version of the game. I'm hopeful that will work again because I enjoyed it quite a bit. A deep line playmaker on defend. 
Now, I'm a little bit hesitant on this role. I think maybe halfback is the best one, but we don't have a halfback at the moment. We will go to the transfer window, see if we can't find one and bring one in. However, we do have a really good deep line playmaker on defense that I'm excited to build the team around. So we're going to go that to start with. It may change as a role to make it a bit more defensive. Two Mazzias on support to have them kind of getting forward from a central area. Two inverted wingers to push into that area, that number 10 position. You can see we've created a pocket of space here with nobody in it. I want to have players break into that space or cutting inside to it. Of course, the inverted the wingers cutting inside and the wing backs on attack looping around the outside of them that's absolutely perfect and an advance forward i was kind of toying with the idea of going for pressing forward but i think there's a couple of young players that we want to go after that are probably better suited to the advance forward role which works perfect for us now i've created this tactic with a couple of things i'm not super confident on slightly shorter passing i'm not 100 clear on we may just go back to slightly more direct if it doesn't work out but for now slightly shorter is fine we are playing with a poorly pressing. It's a little bit more aggressive in terms of where we win the ball back. I think that always suits really well in lower division football in particular. If we go up, potentially we do drop line back a little bit. Potentially we do drop our urgency down a little bit more. We'll see how we go. So I've got this version and then I've got another version which is going to be our possession instructions, which is basically more of a balanced shape. We drop back a little bit deeper. It's still aggressive in where we want to go and win the ball, but the defensive line starts a little bit lower. And it's also a little bit lower tempo, a little bit shorter passing. This is kind of like the last 15 to 20 minutes of a match where we just want to keep possession and we want to keep the ball away from the opposition team. I don't think we did that well enough last season, even in FC Isle of Man, where we had a really good tactic at the end of the series. I don't think we closed out games that well. So I'll be very interested to see how this one plays out. We're going to go attacking as our default pretty much every game, I think, particularly while we're in the second division. And then that possession instruction, that's really how do we control a game now for the last 15, 20 minutes. We might even, for that last period, drop these guys back to be like a classic 4-1-4-1. We'll see how that goes in the next couple of weeks and how we uh, actually want to continue playing throughout the course of the week. Back to our inbox. Club vision and expectations. This stuff's all fine. We're not worried about that. Pre-season preparation, no problems at all. I will get my assistant doing that shortly. All these friendlies that you can see, we're going to get rid of them because I want to set up my own friendlies and we're going to try and do something a little bit different, I think. Squad selection rules all look pretty straightforward, which is fantastic. We must have eight players trained by a club in Germany. No problems there. Four players trained by the club itself, St. Pauli. That's no problem. And squad must have at least 12 German players. That's all pretty straightforward and pretty easy. German transfer window stuff, none of it really relates to us. Scouting center. This is one that I think we're going to come back to in a future date because we're going to set up, I think, a bunch of different scouting targets and maybe put a shortlist together and then we're going to have a look at the scouting induction. So we'll come back to that later. Transfers induction. I think this is all pretty much straightforward stuff, but it is a good chance for us to update some of our responsibilities. So I want to find all the young players for the team. Scouting center can go to the backroom staff. If we have a chief scout, they can do that. Scouting meetings, I'll do for the moment. We might hand those over as well. Training induction. This is one that I do need to pay attention to. So I'm going to go with first team. I'm going to hand over the, to my assistant once we eventually sign one, the general training. We're also going to keep individual training and then I'm going to let the general training for the youth squads go with my backroom staff. That's absolutely fine. We'll put that together. Team report induction. Excellent. This is what we want to see. Crossing is a good strength. Fantastic. We've got uh, creativity running through the wide players. Concentration is pretty good. Player partnerships are good. Youth prospects are good, so there's a few different players that they've highlighted as being players that we could look to for the future, which is fantastic. Smart squad, technique's good. Goalkeeper depth is good. Defender depth, long shots, marking, passing, vision, those are things that could be a little bit improved. Our weaknesses is our transfer budget. That's fine. I'm going to sell a bunch of players. We're going to make cash that way. Natural fitness isn't great. That's okay. I'm an excellent fitness coach, as we saw me set up earlier. Determination and overall depth, not that great. So there are some things that we do need to improve a little bit in the transfer window. We'll talk about that once we get to like our transfers in. Medical center induction, this all looks pretty straightforward. I think there's a couple of long-term injuries here. Buckman's out with a damaged Achilles tendon. I've had an Achilles injury, that sucks for him. Two months, five to six months for Rio Miyachi. I'm not sure if we're gonna keep either of these guys, but we'll see how we go. It might be a struggle to try and sell them off if we can't uh, help them recover. Squad induction, I think this is just dynamics and things, which I'm pretty familiar with, unless it's changed quite a bit. Oh no, this is squad dynamics, which makes sense. So Bubala, Himmelman, and Buckman are the biggest. Uh, team leaders at the club. We will see how they go. Managerial support, very poor because of my experience level, no doubt, but we'll turn that around, don't you worry. Backroom staff, managing friendly manners, I'm going to give to my assistant manager. Press conferences, I'm going to give to... Uh, I'll keep them for the minute. Staff contract renewals, I'm going to take care of. Recruit staff, I'm going to take care of as well for the moment. And broadcast interviews, I'll take care of for the moment as well. So just the friendly matches for them for the moment. Development center, outgoing development loans, backroom staff can do that one. 
general training for youth squads, backroom staff, youth squad stuff, they can all do that. Fantastic. All right, and they've got a whole bunch of stuff here relating to our tactics, our transfer policy, whatever else. We're not gonna do that here because what I wanna do is I wanna put together kind of like a short list and go through the squad and see who we're gonna keep and who we're gonna get rid of. So magic of editing, we're gonna jump forward to that now. So first up, we have turfed a lot of different players. They are currently just down in the under 19s. We are still on the first day, I haven't clicked forward any further. But you can see most of the players that were at the club that are over the age of 23, I've just gotten rid of. And this guy as well, because he's just not very good. Uh, but I have put pretty much everyone on the transfer list. You can see quite a few are upset. I've dropped them down to the under 19 so that they are stacked, start actively wanting to uh, make a move. And what I've done is I've kept a few of the players that I think we could potentially build around. You can see quite a few of them are high potential. Uh, there's a couple there that I think are like workshop projects, like this Lebongu and Bongu guy. I have to keep him. That name is amazing. And maybe if we switch him to the other side and look at the inverter winger traits, He's got quite a few eights or nines in there that I think could very quickly turn to tens, which I think is okay for a second division level, uh, but maybe not necessarily good enough for the Bundesliga. We'll see how that goes. He might be a bit of a project that we work on, but there are some very, very talented players here. Some that I'm incredibly excited to kind of build the team around a little bit. Finn Becker is the big one. I mentioned him when we were talking about our tactic, that deep line playmaker on support. I'm going to work him to be a deep line playmaker on defend and really anchoring midfield at that role. He's pretty much over 12 for all of the key traits that you can see here. Balance at 11 needs a little bit of improvement, but his passing's good, his first touch, his technique is good. Only 20 years of old age, 20 years of old, that's not a thing that people say. And then also, he's at a St. Pauli product, so I think he's gonna be huge for us and potentially a team leader for this season. So we're gonna try and build around him a little bit. The other one that I'm very excited about is this guy, Lucas Dashner, who's 21. I think he will be the oldest player that I've kept in the squad. He's number 10 by trade, but he can also do this inverted winger role on the left-hand side. He's right-footed, which is fantastic. Why I'm excited about him isn't necessarily even the inverted winger role. I think we could get him to be an advanced playmaker on that left-hand side, which worked quite well for us in the final seasons at Isle of Man. It's rare that you find a player that can do that role. So again, if you look at him, for the key roles of that traits, he's pretty much 12 or 13 for all of them. And at 21 years of age, he's still got a bit of a ceiling to come, which could see him be an incredibly important player for us. So I'm excited to see what he can do cutting in from the left-hand side, really trying to pull the strings for us, almost like a number 10 playing slightly off position or slightly off center. The rest of the players are pretty much going to be largely backup players. Like there's some good players in there, but the reality is I don't think many of them would be anything other than like squad depth players or players that we keep around to try and ensure that we have two players for every position sort of thing. As far as inbound players go, there's 11 here and I want to try and bring in 11 as well to balance us back out. Which takes us to our scouting list. There might be some familiar names here that you guys have seen in previous versions of Football Manager. I don't know who the best players are in and around Football Manager yet this year. I think, you know, that's going to kind of come to the fore over the next month or so. You know, as more and more people get five years into a save or 10 years into a save or whatever else. There are names that you may remember. Matthias Arezzo, he was fantastic in last year's version of the game. Uh, Renier was fantastic in last year's version of the game. Isaac Bergman, you know, Hansen was fantastic in last year's version of the game. So there are a couple of familiar names that you guys might have seen here in previous years. This may not necessarily be everyone that we've got. This is just the people that I think we've found in good spots. And then potentially we might try and bring them in a little bit further. How have I found them? You might be wondering. I just kind of trawl through under 19 squads in different clubs, different places, and see who I can find. And if there's people that jump out at me as being particularly high potential, like this guy, Leandro Jimenez in the Argentine under 19s, he's only 15 years of age. So he's probably got incredibly high potential ability. Only on 400 euro, only worth 400 euro. There has been a bit of a tweak to the you know prices you can pay for players this year, which is fantastic to see. That definitely needed an update. That's kind of how I've gone through and snuck a few of these players on there. Some of the others are just players that I know from Football Manager 2020. Some of them are players that we've searched for because we've got a not bad scouting range. You can see our recruitment package is just basically around Germany, but it does help highlight some of the free transfers that we're looking at here and a couple of the other players as well. There isn't really anyone over the age of 18. There's one free transfer that's 19, which is absolutely fine. We'll have a look at that. Even if we can't get all these players in, we will at least continue trying to add to this list and trying to bring more of a group in. And it's a good spread. It's going to be a very cosmopolitan side if we get all of our targets throughout the course of the year. The big other thing that we have to do is we're only on 899k as far as our transfer budget is concerned. So we're going to have to sell some of those players in the reserve team to try and then bring in a lot of these targets. A lot of these deals that I've bid on, if we have a look at the bids that we've made, it says a million plus, but what it is, it's effectively like 300,000 now and then 700,000 over the next like three years and whatever else. So we are gambling a little bit on the long-term future of this team. Uh, and a lot of these people that we're going to bring in 
even if we get them this year, we're going to have to develop them over a two or three year period to get that return on investment and not risk sending the finances the wrong way. But so far, finance is doing quite well. 17 million in the bank, absolutely perfect. If we sell and purchase at the same rate, we should be in a fantastic position financially. Staff, I have jettisoned everybody. There is nobody else hanging around. Just Oka Gottlich, the president and the chief doctor, who I can't sack, are there. We've got a couple of players on staff shortlist. Now, the way that I've approached this is I've gone and searched for unemployed people that have international caps, which is a really easy way of trying to find players and staff that have high potential. What you are more likely to get if you search for that is players like Andrea Barzagli that you can see here who had a very long career with the Italian national side and with Juventus but doesn't necessarily have like the highest coaching experience. So he might be more willing to come across for his first non-playing role, so to speak, which is fantastic for us. We'll try and bring him across and get him in. There's a few other players that you might recognize in there. Roy Keane's in there, Dennis Bergkamp's in there. Bergkamp, I don't think we're gonna get, I think Ajax has already bid on him, but that will be a fantastic one to see. As far as our fixtures are concerned, we've got friendly proposals out to play a few different sides in and around Austria, which is where our training camp is this season. I've just moved them up to be like larger sides, sides playing at the top tier. And then two big friendlies to kind of finish off our preseason program against Roma and Milan at home. Hopefully they will get us a little bit of extra cash in terms of gate receipts, but that's depending on them all kind of, you know, accepting our bids and whatever else. Then the last one, we've got Minas Hagen and the DFB Pokal first round. They are a lower division side, which is perfect. Hopefully we beat the living piss out of them and start our season really well. Depending on time, we might also do the game against Darmstadt to start the season as well. But what we're going to do now is, again, magic of editing, jump forward a little bit, hopefully through pre-season. Full disclosure, it may not be today that I finish recording this episode. It may be tomorrow. We'll jump forward and have a look at how and see how we go. But we're going to try and bring in a lot of those players, and then I'm going to introduce you guys to the squad and let you know how our pre-season fixtures have gone. All right, and just like that, we are a fair chunk of time further ahead. Full disclosure, I've recorded all the way through, so if I start kind of like drooping down a little bit here at the standing desk, by all means, uh, tell me to get my shit together in the comment section below. Scouting, we have gone through and we have identified quite a few different players. Uh, I've also come up with this kind of display, which I'm quite enjoying, uh, getting a bunch of the different information up there on the screen at the same time. There are some big names on this list of players that we still want to try and bring in, but they are effectively, I think, some of the biggest wonder kids left in the game. I don't think we're ever going to get Ansu Fatty. I don't think we're ever going to get Kamavinga. I don't think we're going to get like Mbappe and Haaland and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that we didn't get in Football Manager 2020 was a save where we got a handle and a hold of one of the best wonder kids at the start of the game. I'm not saying this series will be that, but it would be fantastic if potentially we could get a hold of one of the best wonder kids in the game and see how they go two, three years in the future. We have to get promoted for that to happen. You will see there's a couple of names that were on the previous list that I just showed you guys earlier on that are still there. We didn't get Johansson. He wouldn't come across. He just signed a new contract. There's a few other players here, there, and everywhere that we're going to keep an eye on over the next few days, weeks, and months anyway, but it's a very good list, and we've scouted them all fully. So we've got targets coming out our ears for the next couple of seasons. Staff, pretty much the same thing. We got most of the players that we tried to bring in. Uh, there's a couple of players that we brought in, or a couple of coaches that we brought in based on their attributes, just searching for the key attributes. So we've got a good goalkeeper coach here, Gerald Ehrman. He looks to be quite, quite decent, which is fantastic for us. Bartek Zilstrak, I'm going to go with. Uh, which is probably butchering the pronunciation. Apologies to any of our Polish watchers or viewers listening along. He looks fantastic. We brought him across from Brentford uh, and he's got very good technical and attacking coaching. So perfect. We needed to coach in that area. As far as the ex-professionals are concerned, uh, Roy Keane is my assistant manager, which is hilarious. Paul Robinson, David Villa, Ricky Spragia, who I think was a coach at Manchester United back in the day. He was indeed under 23's manager before getting the sack. Uh, and now he's come across to join us in Germany. Tim Cahill, Patrice Edvra, Park Ji Sung in with the under-19 squad. A couple of ex-scouts that used to play at a decent level, Vicente, Torado, Grun, Radzinski. All ex-professionals. That's just, that's my strategy. That's how it works. Physios, we've just gone on their physio rating, which is fantastic to see. And that brings us to the squad itself. The part that I know you guys are super keen to see and super keen to get further visuals on. It's not everyone that we said we were going to go after uh, at the start of the preseason window, but I'm very, very happy with the squad that we put together. You can see everyone spits into this shape quite nicely. There's nowhere that we're kind of short on players. This will be potentially our starting 11, and we might as well run through it in that particular order, or at least by position. So Federico Losas, we had identified, and I think I clicked on last time uh, to show you how we kind of uncovered him. He joins from Chacarita Juniors over in Argentina. He looks decent, two and a half star current ability, five star potential for a young goalkeeper at 18 years of age, absolutely fantastic. We paid a little bit of cash for him, 800K, but again, it's like 300 up front, 500 over the next few years, which is perfect for us. Works well with our current transfer budget, which has been absolutely fantastic. 
Back up behind him, Victor Weber comes through the St. Pauli Academy. He was previously at Hamburger SV and Schenefeld. We didn't sign him new, but he's more than capable of being a backup player. And at 17, has plenty of potential left. Four and a half star potential ability. Perfect to get that clear starting goalkeeper and backup choice sorted early. Uh, over at right back, we have brought in Thomas Gundeland, who joins from Velja or Vejle. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Let me know in the comment section below to any of our Danish fans. Over in the Superliga, he looks absolute quality. He's going to be a wing back on attack. He's already comfortable as a wing back. On that side, we're going to get him used to the attacking role, which is just basically his crossing and dribbling has to be better. Lots of 11s, lots of 12s. Very excited to see how he goes. Only 18 years of age again. Three-star current ability, five-star potential ability. Didn't pay a crazy amount for him, 700K. And again, it's like 300 up front, 400 over the next few years. So it's not going to kill us financially. The backup to him will be another St. Pauli prospect, Jans Vikoff, who again, comfortable at a wingback role. Absolutely perfect. I don't think he's going to start all that many games. But as a backup player is concerned, fantastic. Two and a half star current ability, five star potential for him. Over on the left back side, a little bit more of a challenge at left back. I'm not going to lie. We've gone with Juan Rodriguez, another Argentine joining the ranks. Three star current and five star potential ability. Looks to be very good. Not as comfortable as a wing back on attack. How we're going to use him. Needs to improve his crossing and his dribbling. His use with the ball isn't quite as high as we'd want it to be. But defensively, very, very good. Physically, very, very good as well. 16 acceleration and pace at 18 years of age. Absolutely superb. Be very interesting to see how he goes. He joins from Banfield over in Argentina. The backup to him will be another FC Isle of Man, oh, sorry, FC St. Pauli prospect. I will probably do that four or five times throughout the series. Correct me at always in the comment section below. Sasha Volker. Now, he doesn't look as strong. Only three and a half star potential ability, one and a half star current. So we're not super strong at that left back position. We may keep an eye on that in future transfer windows. But again, we're going to get him set up as a wing back on attack. His crossing, dribbling, not horrific. Uh, physically not horrific either, but there's a lot that he needs to work on to get ready for first team football. Central defense, we are incredibly strong, mainly because I had some cash left over and went after a big player. I'll bring that player to you at the end. The internal player that we've kept, Burke Dogan, 18-year-old Austrian, two-star current ability, five-star potential, left-footed center back. I love left-footed center backs to give us that balance at the back. He looks like he's going to be a cracking player. We do have to get him working to be a ball-playing defender. He's not quite there with the ball yet, so there's a little bit that we need him working on. The other backup player is a player that we've signed, Botond Balo, joins us from Parma over in Serie A. Three-star current ability, five-star potential. Looks to be absolutely fantastic. At 18 years of age, he's already got one Hungarian cap. Not... Either 100% comfortable as a ball-playing defender, but not miles off. I think he's very, very good. He would have started, and that's why he's got the number five, if we hadn't signed one player who I'll get to in a moment. The other defender that has joined us, we spent a little bit of cash on this guy, Max Norman Williamson, a 17-year-old Norwegian who looks to be a physical beast. Again, not super comfortable as a ball-playing defender, but he can play as a ball-playing defender as a stopper, which I'm excited to see how that progresses over the next few years. Got some very good traits, good heading, good tackling ability, good marking, excellent bravery, good determination, good positioning, which is fantastic. His jumping reach is huge. His acceleration and stamina are both fantastic. He's going to be fantastic for us. We did pay quite a bit for him, 2.2 million. He's one of the higher players that we purchased. Again, though, not all up front. I think he was like 500K up front and the rest over the next few years. But the big one, arguably the biggest signing that we've made, Armel Belakotchap joins from VFL Bochum. We spoke about the registration rules and needing German players and needing young German players to meet our board expectations. And I wasn't going to go after him, but we just had a bit of cash left over. So we paid 5 million euro, easily the most that we paid for any of these players. For Armel Belakotchap, he looks fantastic already. He looks like a player ready to play at a Bundesliga level at 18 years of age, which is phenomenal to see. Ball playing defender on defender already, so he's comfortable in that role. He can pretty much do everything that we need him to do, at least at a level of 11 or 12 or higher. Long-term deal, 10K a week, doesn't kill us financially, and he's set to be a star player, so he's going to be absolutely fantastic for us. Thrilled to have Bella Kochap joining us, and I think getting like a young German star along the likes of Finn Becker, who we'll speak about in a moment, and Dashner and that sort of thing, we're going to get a good German core going in this St. Pauli lineup. Moving forward to the defensive midfield position, we've got two players, Maximilian Schutt, who's again another player coming through the St. Pauli Academy. Looks okay, but just a backup player. Probably more of a project at one and a half star current ability. And the reason he's a project is because we've got a player that I think will be the first name on the team sheet each and every week if he's fit. Finn Becker, who we've already spoken about. Progressing fantastically well during off-season as well. Already really comfortable. Four-star at the deep-line playmaker role. Once we get him comfortable as a defensive deep-line deep playmaker, he's going to be fantastic for us as well. Four-star current ability and potential ability. He is likely also going to be our captain for this season. Fantastic stuff from the young German. 
Moving forward in midfield, we've recruited it pretty aggressively. I'll show you the two backups first. Afiz Aremo was already at AFC St. Pauli at the start of this match. Three-star current ability and five-star potential for the 20-year-old Nigerian. Ball-winning midfielder, which isn't great. We've got him working towards being a Mazaya in midfield, or Mazala, or however you want to pronounce it. So we'll see how he goes with that progression. He needs, again, to do a little bit more in terms of what he does with the ball, but he's stuffed without the ball. Fantastic. Good tackler, great aggression, good determination, good work rate, physically very gifted as well. He'll be fantastic for us as like a third choice central midfield option. The other one that's joined is Patrick Finger, who we signed on a free transfer. Uh, Two-star current ability, four-star potential, 19-year-old German that came through at Eintracht Frankfurt. Would prefer to play as a number 10, but can play in the middle, which is where we're going to get him working. Good technical attributes, good mental attributes, good physical attributes for a free transfer. Absolutely fantastic to have him on board and sorting out the squad. The two starters that we're going to go with, the first one, Emmanuel Giabua. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, but he's joined from Atalanta over in Syria uh, again. We've had a little bit of success bringing across those players uh, from Italy. A box box midfielder by trade. He has been working as being a Messiah on support for the last few weeks. Technically very good. Uh, most stuff sitting around a 10 or 11 that we need him to be able to do. We'll get him on a specialist regime to get that up. You can see already a few of his mental and physical attributes already improving quite a bit. Excellent mental traits for what we need him to do. Great off the ball, great work rate, good acceleration, good natural fitness, good pace, good stamina. All the stuff we need from a box-to-box -box midfielder or a Mazala in our particular shape and formation. Be fantastic to see how he goes this season. I expect big things. 1.3 million we paid for him, but again, not that much up front. I think it was like 300k up front and a million over the next year. Alongside him, we've gone with the Spanish playmaker, Kepa Uriarte, who has joined from Athletic Bilbao. You can see his central midfielder on attack is his preferred role. We're going with a Mazaya, which he's progressing nicely. And two and a half star current ability, five star potential. 18 year old Spanish youth international. Good technical attributes, excellent passing and technique already. Good mental attributes, good decision making, good determination, good vision, which is perfect for that player a little bit deeper, pulling the strings. Good physical attributes, does need to improve his, his stamina and his strength a little bit, but at 18, there's no real concern over him over the long-term future. Paid 1.5 million for him, uh, which isn't terrible. Does come with a high pedigree. He's also, I think, maybe a project. We did have someone else that we were looking at for that kind of like central midfield role that we didn't get because they re-signed a new contract with their club. But I'm excited about him. I think he's going to be good. And he's close to getting, I think, under 19 caps to his name as well for the Spanish national side, which is fantastic. We'll build around him over the next couple of seasons. And of course, left-footed central midfielder. We get that alongside a right-footed central midfielder. It's going to be absolutely perfect for us. Moving out to the left wing now, Lucas Dashner, we already spoke about a little bit, building the squad around him. He's progressed quite nicely as a wide player. Still comfortable in that inverted winger role, also working as playing as an advanced playmaker. That might be something that we pull out of the hat in the next few days, weeks, months, whatever else. Excellent technical ability, excellent mental attributes, excellent physical traits as well for what we need him to do. Acceleration needs a little bit of pace. Oh, sorry, needs a little bit of an improvement. But if we move him to be an advanced playmaker, it doesn't really matter as much because he's looking to move into pockets of space rather than flying around in behind. Very excited to see what he does. Orel Lubongu Mbongu, we've already spoken about. I couldn't just say no to that name. Uh, he's working to be that inverted winger backup player on that left-hand side. So it's not the best depth in terms of competitiveness for positions, but you know we're going to start most of these German players as soon as they're ready to go. Over on the right, we had a little bit more of a struggle, to be completely honest with you guys. So we've made a free transfer signing. Dion McGee joins from after playing at Manchester United, being released from his contract. Left-footed player on the right-hand side. I love that he's going to be cutting back in on his favoured foot. Perfect for that role. But only two-star current ability, four-and-a-half-star potential. So he's not the highest of the tiers as far as players that we could bring in for that position. And some of that was due to player availability. There just weren't that many players that we found for that right wing role. But time will tell, he could surprise us. He does have some good tra good traits. I think he's the better of the two free transfer signings that we made. He's on a couple of year contract and he is English. So even if we just put him back on the transfer list, I guarantee someone from like League Two will come forward and want to purchase him. He is also an advanced playmaker by trade. It will be interesting to see. Maybe we go two advanced playmakers on each wing. I don't know. That's something for the future. We don't have to worry too much about it right now. The backup to him will be Maury Bamba, who actually joins us from Roma. Perhaps a little bit more exciting player, perhaps more of a conventional winger. Uh, he is a left-footed player playing on the right as well, which is fantastic for our balance and for our depth. Comes across from Rome for a million pound, or sorry, a million euros, 300k up front, 700k over the next three years. So we are spending a bit. He might be a bit of a project player. And definitely, I think this right wing spot is where we've got perhaps the most competitiveness for a start. I would be more than happy starting Maury Bamba ahead of Dion McGee if things don't go his way. The reason I haven't started him is I think he might be better served off the bench. You can see 15 acceleration, 15 agility, 13 pace. Doesn't have the best stamina though, only eight and only six for strength. So if he comes on with the last 20 minutes to go in a game, 
that pace is going to help buy him space and going to help us quite a bit unlocking tired defences. But he also doesn't have the stamina to do that for a 90-minute period, which is why I've gone with McGee as the starting option. Otherwise, though, good flair, good dribbling ability, good finishing, good crossing. Very happy to have him on board. And that does take us up front where we've got two, I think, very exciting players. Ariston Akame comes through the Youth Academy at FC St. Pauli. One and a half star current ability, three and a half star potential. Not the best in the world, but you'll see why I'm comfortable with that in a little moment. He'll be the backup player, can play on a wing if we need him to as well, so good versatility off the bench. The starter that we've gone with is Louis Carbonell, 17-year-old Spanish youth international that joins us from Zaragoza. Can play as a false nine, which is what immediately attracted my eye to him, but we're going to start him as an advanced forward, get him comfortable in that role and see how he goes. He has got most of the key traits for it. If it doesn't work out, we'll switch him to a false nine to see how that goes in our shape and structure. But very good dribbling, first touch and finishing, very good passing and technique for a player so young. Very good mental attributes, very good physical attributes, two-star current ability, five-star potential. I'm incredibly excited to see what Carbonell can do. But... That isn't everything because we've got some players that are going to join us in the future that we have picked up. And full disclosure, I signed them kind of accidentally and then realized that they weren't actually going to join until a year in advance. The first one is Renier, who joins to play on the right-hand side of midfield. 17-year-old Brazilian, he doesn't actually join us until the 12th of the 7th, 2021. So we're not going to see him season one, but season two, very excited to see what he's got planned for us. He looks like he's going to be an absolute beast as far as players on that right-hand side are concerned. So maybe that right-hand side position, we're just trying to get through this year, and then we're going to bring in some more depth and some higher quality in Renier. And then the other one, Matthias Arezzo, he actually joins us in January. So we need Carbonell six months to see if he can improve and get to the position of being a starting striker. And then we've got Matthias Arezzo joining us, who is an absolute beast. We didn't pay that much for him either. 2.5 million, I think is very, very reasonable for a player of his quality and of his potential. The 17-year-old Uruguayan, 16 heading already, 14 finishing, good composure, good determination, good off-the-ball movement, excellent physical attributes as well, 16 stamina, 15 acceleration. Yes, we're going back to the well. Yes, we're going back to a player that was very good in FM20, but I'm very excited to get him across and have him leading the line for us from January on. But really, it's up to Carbonell. If he can go and make that position his own, that starting spot, I don't see any reason why you can't keep a hold of it. Now, we do have a couple of knocks, a couple of injuries. Our preseason results have been largely negative, to be honest, but that is mainly because we had so many players out. You can see even these games here that we played uh, during our preseason training camp, the results weren't fantastic. And that's because we're playing with largely the backup players. We hadn't signed a lot of the players that are going to be part of the starting 11. Once we started getting those players in, we started to improve a little bit more as well. And most recently, we beat Milan 3-2 and in our final preseason friendly. Absolutely fantastic. I haven't been coaching any of these, by the way, either. It's been our assistant manager, Roy Keane. But Arima getting on the score sheet, Dashner and Langford, fantastic stuff from them. And yeah, it's preseason results. I'm not too worried about it. We're going to see how we go in this actual game and this actual contest to uh, see how the match and how the squad is put together. Couple of knocks though. So we are going to rotate just a little bit. Finn Beck is not going to start, which is interesting. We'll see how that goes. I'm going to put in Arimu as the deep line or deep defensive midfielder for this first one. We might switch him to be a ball playing defender or a halfback, which I'm very excited to see how that one works out. I just don't want to risk Finn Becker. It's going to be a long season. We're not going to worry too much about forcing him through too much football in the early part of the season. Otherwise, though, we are at pretty much full strength. It's just that one spot. And he is our captain, so it is a big loss. But uh, hopefully, we can get through to the next round of the DFB Pokal. So it just occurred to me as I was clicking through, we're not going to get the same like screen that we usually cut back to, which is the lineup screen because it's changed again this season. Uh, but there are some cool things that you see in your match day squads now. There's a few players that are ready to go in terms of the tactical instructions because they've been playing with this all throughout preseason. Team selections, there's a few people that are happy. Victor Weber, Morris Grosh, Mishat, Zalazar, Bamba. Bamba's probably the biggest name that's unhappy with being left out. We might bring him on for Dion McGee and see if that keeps him happy uh, for the next few days, weeks, months, whatever else. Now, I've seen this a couple of places on Twitter, this new team sheet lineup. I'm going to be honest, I don't like this. I wish it was the old one. I like That was the one thing that I liked. I liked that it had that kind of TV display to show you the teams and the lineups and the shape. I think that helped quite a bit. But, you know, whatever. They've made that decision. We've got to stick with it now for the next 12 months. It doesn't give us the best, I think, visibility on the opposition either in the shape and stuff that they're playing. Like the way I used to do match previews and stuff before we went into games is going to change this year, obviously, because of the way the information is displayed now. But... You know, we'll deal with that and we'll uh, work our way through it. Now, team talks. I haven't done fantastically well so far with team talks, but I think the way this works is it's just there's a different gesture that represents the way you used to pick, like calm or aggressive or whatever else. So if you hover over them, you can kind of see, you know, what do they all say? So hands together, I think, is calm or oh, no, cautious. 
Hands in pockets, I think is calm. No, reluctant. Hands on hips, maybe that's calm. Pump fist is like, get everyone going, encourage everybody. Outstretched arms is, I think, they're like excited and thrash arms is obviously the aggressive one. We'll see more at halftime relating to like throwing bottles and that sort of stuff. We'll see how that goes. I think we're just gonna go with point finger assertively and just say, play your natural game, the results will come. We've got a few players that are motivated, fantastic. This is the uh, senior debut for a lot of the squad. We've been asked a question, you're about to take charge of your first match as FC St. Pauli manager. Can you sum up your feelings on an occasion like this? Can't wait to get started in a wonderful job. Kepa Uriade's lack of match fitness, I think he's going to be fine. I, To be honest, I haven't really been paying attention to his match fitness. This looks absolutely fantastic. I'm going to give Football Manager a ton of credit for how good the match engine looks this year and how good the 3D looks. Uh, we will probably stay on 3D for this series as well. And then maybe when we do our long-term save, our Pentagon Challenge, we might drop back to 2D match engine and then you know 3D replays. But we'll see how that goes uh, as we get through this. This is very, very slow, so I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. We do have an early kickoff. I'm just going to go key highlights. We're going to go replay events just for goals, which is fantastic. I don't have to look at that fucking VAR thing uh, each and every week or that disallowed goal did it cross the line. Match speed during text only, a fast start. I'm going to pick this up just a little bit. Let's uh, see how we go. Bella Kochap, deep free kick here into the into our own half for the first time. Rodriguez with the switch out towards McGee. He's going to want to get back on his left peg. He's actually gotten beaten by the defender, but the tackle falls to Carbonell. Back to McGee, back stick ball towards Dashner, who's clipped the post, and then they managed to scramble it away. So good stuff from the uh, opposition, or good stuff from the lineup at the moment. We might go with TV view and maybe a high camera, but super zoomed in. Does that kind of that kind of looks like the 2D match engine, which is what I'm trying to replicate. We're gonna keep an eye on a few of these stats. XG, of course, in the game for the first time this year. I don't know really what to make of it. Yeah, I like that much better. Let me know what your preferred like camera view is in the comment section below, though. I will change it and amend it as needed based on your feedback. But if we can get something that's like 3D but still gives us that like kind of over visibility that we get with 2D, fantastic. Good ball in there from Rodriguez on the overlap. Good header from Bella Kochat puts it back in. Uriate spreads it out wide to Rodriguez. Can he find the cut back? Oh, it's pinballed around there. Wallenborn in the goal for Minahausen. I've already forgotten the team that we're playing his name. McGee's going to take the corner. Wraps his left foot around it. Backstick ball towards Carbonell. Good header, but just over the crossbar. Also got to keep on an eye on conditioning a little bit differently. We've got to have a look at these hearts and the colors that they represent, which is just, let's be honest, like the percentages still exist. It's just a different way of displaying the information that was already in the game, which is quite, I think that's a lot of the things that they've changed this match. Oh, hang on, here we go. The team's gotten in behind. We've conceded to a lower division side. This is not boating particularly well for our St. Pauli career. We can use a shout though. So we're going to go demand more, entire team. Let's see how they respond. It's the first highlight we've seen from them, but it's a good ball in behind into the channel there. He just gets goal side on Bella Kochat, who we paid all that money for. And then a good save, not a good save from Los Ass, but to be fair, it had a bit of venom on it. Bolton with the goal for them. But what I was saying is it's pretty much the same traits. Like it doesn't matter if it's a percentage condition or this little heart thing. It's, you know, it's still measuring something somewhere. McGee, good ball in from the corner. We've had a few chances from corners that we haven't made the most of. Gundeland with the ball comes forward on the right hand side. First real foray forward for him. Ball in across. Carbonell knocks it down for Aramu. Now Uriato strike from the edge of the area. It wasn't miles away. The keeper was scrambling as it just sails beyond the far post. And at half time, we might have to pull out a bit of a dummy spit here. You can see XG is showing that we should be well and truly above them. But their goal kind of came out of nothing. They had no chances up until that point. Okay, let's go. Should I throw the water bottle? Yeah, screw it. Let's do it. Far from pleased with what I just saw. And a few players seem motivated, but a lot seem demotivated, which isn't great. So maybe we try and save this and just, let's just say assertively, you have the ability to make a difference. Can we try and pick everybody up? You have the ability to make a difference. You have the ability to make a difference. Okay, all right. So I've brought a couple of them back, but there are still a few players that are demotivated. We might have to keep an eye on that as we uh, get towards the hour mark and have a look at subs and changes. McGee here with the corner. He's been busy from corners. And again, we head straight over the crossbar. I might have to go and do some specific Training regimes, not training regimes, but for specific set piece tactics. That might be something that we have to work on in a future episode to go through. Throw in, left hand side. We'll let this one play out and we're going to have a look at some subs because we're right towards the hour mark. Aremu to Dashner, back to Aremu again. Over to Dashner, got the overlap here from Rodriguez, who's been good around the left hand side, it must be said. Very confident with the ball. Good cross in towards Carbonell and it's just over the crossbar. And uh, we're going to have to hit pause there because we have to make some changes to try and get the most out of this game. So Losas not having a good game, apparently. Carbonell not having a good game, apparently. Gundeland not having a good game either. I think we're going to make a couple of different changes. I'm going to take off Dion, Dion McGee for Maury Bamba. They're saying Gundeland's not playing particularly well. I'll bring on Jan Zvikov. 
We'll see how that goes. I'm gonna hold off on the last two, but what we might do is we might use some specific traits. I'm gonna say, just calm. I'm just gonna say no gesture. I'm gonna say, I have faith in you, make a difference, and neither of them responded perfectly. So team talk's not going particularly well at the moment. We're gonna hit play, and then I'm gonna hit pause in a second, because I wanna do specific shouts for specific players. I'm gonna tell Carbonell and Losas to fire up a little bit. And let's try and give them a little bit of a kick out the backside and see how they respond. I might also change this from general info to body language. It won't let me do it because we've got a highlight. Hopefully this is a goal and uh, I'll be happy. Bamba, first involvement from the sub. Cuts it back to Arimo. Now Uriarte. Good ball over to Dashner. He's got the overlap there from Rodriguez. Ball into Carbonell. Can he find the finish? It's an excellent tackle, it must be said, from the uh, defense. I think it was brought back for being uh, offside anyway. Not offside, sorry. Uh, or it might have been offside. Who knows why it was up. Uh, we're going to switch this to be body language as well, which means uh, what I don't really like about this interface is that we don't see anything from the other team. We can pick some things for them. Their formation, do we care more about that than we do the latest scores? Can I get rid of this dugout one? Can we do something with that? I don't know. I'm not sure how I feel about the touchline tablet, to be completely honest, but we'll leave that up, body language, for the moment. Okay, let's encourage everybody. 10 minutes to go. We, oh, we're potentially going to go out of the cup here, which will be a very horrific way to start the series. Dashner with the ball in. It's cleared off the line by Barra. Bella Kochap can put it back in. Out now to Dashner. Can he get a good ball in the box? We haven't seen enough from Dashner, who's supposed to be one of our bigger and better players. Good clearance. Vikoff with a throw in. Right-hand side goes to Bamba. It's cleared away by the defense. Mina Hagen, uh, or Minas Hagen are going to go through here. Three minutes to be added on, which is not great. And we've started the series and we've started the save with a defeat, which is not great. We didn't play terribly. Uh, our defense did quite well. Rodriguez and Bella Kochap highest ratings was 7.8. McGee had a good game. Bamba didn't do much when he came on. Carbonell struggled. Williamson struggled. Losas struggled. It's not great. I'm going to say you weren't good enough today. We should have been winning that match. And everyone seems motivated, which is good. Okay, so don't throw the bottle. That, that's, I think that's the thing that you can take away from this. Don't throw the bottle. Don't ever do it. We lost, but we were by far the better team and there were plenty of positives in the performance. You must feel robbed after that. How on earth did you lose it? And I'm just going to say, we played brilliantly. I can't fold that. Just luck wasn't on our side. Okay, let's go with that. They won highlight. They won. You know, being FM'd, I guess, is still a thing. But I, to be completely clear, I don't know if my tactic works yet. So it could just be our tactic is shit. They had one shot and won one nil. We had 71% of the ball. They had 29%. Lawrence Vollenborn, who I think is their goalkeeper. He is their goalkeeper. Gets a man in the match award. Six saves and an 8.8 match rating. Fantastic. I really appreciate the fact that goalkeepers can get good match ratings now and be uh, the best player in the game. Bella Kochap impresses on his debut. We get 175k. Are the board pissed? Reach second round. We failed. Are they that upset with it? Okay. So they're... That's going to be a struggle. I'm not going to lie. That's going to be a, a bit difficult to uh, overcome early on, but that's absolutely fine. I just send my assistant to the press conference because I think that's going to bring today's episode to an end. Looking forward, we might play the Darmstadt game off screen or should we come back and do it tomorrow? Yeah, maybe we'll come back tomorrow and we'll do Darmstadt 98 uh, in third position and Eintracht Braunschweig and we'll start our Bundesliga season and hopefully, fingers crossed, we get some better results and get through to the end of the match. So it does bring us to the end of episode one. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for everyone who's been incredibly patient as well uh, as we work towards releasing this content. I know it's a little bit late, but you know I kind of look back and I'm happy with the way that we've kind of made our decisions. So far, early on in the FM21 cycle, we've allowed FC Isle of Man enough room to breathe, which that series absolutely deserved. We haven't just immediately rushed into the next thing. And um, we've also improved our setup and we've improved hopefully the quality of content that's gonna be coming your way throughout the course of this year as well. And plenty more exciting things to come. So if you have feedback, positive or negative, drop it down in the comments section below. If you've enjoyed the series, if you've enjoyed the beta, if you've enjoyed Football Manager 2021, let me know what saves you've had in the comment section as well. I do respond to every single comment that I get. And if you want to help celebrate the start of Football Manager 2021 content on the channel, you can drop a like on this video. You can also subscribe to be kept up to date on all of our future videos as they release all the way through the course of this year and well into 2021 also. But more than anything, I just appreciate you guys watching. That's the part that means most to me. I've been Sean and I'll see you guys again in the mixer.